Hello, my name is Steve Backshaw. I am a biologist and I'm also a shark diver. I am the presenter of Shark with Steve Backshaw, which is a Sky original. And today we're going to be breaking down shark movies and finding out how they relate to reality. He's behind you! Wow. So I guess the first and most important thing to say about this is scale. When I was first studying biology, we were taught that Megalodon didn't get to be anything like this size and that all previous estimates had been massively overstated. But now, scientists are coming round to an idea of Megalodon being at least that kind of size. So what you see in this movie may seem utterly ludicrous, but it's possible. It's certainly within the, the boundaries what scientists think Megalodon could have achieved in terms of size. It's very tricky having an even educated guess of what Megalodon would have been like. Its teeth are one of the most commonly found fossils in the fossil record. There are millions of them. Other parts of its body are almost non-existent. So everything we're reconstructing from those teeth the closest modern simulacrum is the great white shark. Its teeth are very, very similar in their morphology to those of Megalodon. So you kind of take great white and you scale it up. Hello. Well, hi. Name's Bruce. It's all right, I understand. Why well, trust a shark, right? <laughs> Where do I start? I, I mean, first of all, sharks don't talk. <laughs> sharks aren't all Australian, although they probably have the highest diversity of shark species of anywhere in the world. But there are some things there that are really intriguing. So the picture of the, uh, of the great white, it looks absolutely demonic because it has spilling rows of teeth coming out of its mouth. And that's exactly what great whites have. They have at least five rows of teeth which roll back behind the front active row of teeth which fall out constantly throughout its life. It's losing them perhaps every few weeks and might go through 30,000 teeth in a lifetime. We got company. What's well, about time, mate. We've already gone through the snakes and I'm still starving. We almost had that little feeding frenzy. Oh, come on, let's get this over with. So in this sequence, we've got three different species. It looks like great white, great hammerhead, and I, I guess mako uh, that are all hanging out together like they're, like they're pals and they're, they're mates. Uh, in actuality, makos are a pelagic shark that's very rarely found close to land and tend to be solitary. Uh, great hammerheads are found in association with other species of sharks, but certainly not great whites or makos, um, and great whites, very rarely found in association with any other shark species. So the fish skeleton coming out of its mouth there, that's, that's real. Mako sharks are obligate fish feeders and very, very specialized in feeding on fast moving fish. Okay, that's mine. Get Dory, get out. Get Ow. Oh, oh, Are you yeah. okay? Ow, ow, I'm ow. so sorry. Uh, you really caught me there. Am I bleeding? Oh. Ow. Dory, are you okay? Oh. Oh, that's good. Intervention! This is intriguing. So the single drop of blood in the water has turned our shark into a killing machine. And I guess that's one of the things that people think of first when they think of sharks, certainly great whites, is that they are just these absolute monsters that are focused by blood and driven into a shark feeding frenzy. The uh, the element of sensing tiny amounts of blood in water is definitely true. So a shark can sense at least one single drop of blood in an Olympic swimming pool sized area of water. Who is it? Dory, help me find a way out. Sorry, you'll have to come back later. We're trying to escape. Okay, there's a way out. There's gotta be a way out. Look, here's something. Escape. I wonder what that means. It's funny. It's spelled just like the word escape. Let's go. Ah! Wait a minute, you can read? I can read? That's right, I can read! Well, Once it actually gets activated by the blood though, this idea that there is a frenzy, that everything goes completely crazy, that the animal just sees red and scratches around all over the place, is completely false. I have swum at least a hundred times, if not many more than that, in situations where you have 
blood and food in the water. You have sharks zipping about your ears at top speed, snapping bits of food out of the water, and they still avoid you. They are still so focused on their source of food, and it's not you. For me, the most important thing is making sure that people know they don't eat people. And, you know, there are a handful of people harmed by sharks around the world each year, but it is statistically insignificant. You're much more likely to be killed taking a selfie or by stationary or by a falling coconut or by a falling vending machine. You're hundreds of times more likely to be struck by lightning. And I think that until we get in our heads the sense that this is a very vulnerable animal that is in big trouble because of us, then we simply have no chance of addressing their future. So Jaws, had to be Jaws. The two single notes of music that have done more damage to any other species in history. Um, I love Jaws, it's one of my favorite films of all time. Um, what it says about sharks and what has happened as a result is pretty awful. <laughs> this is the first attack in the film and it's brutal and it's terrifying and it's worth thinking about. There are ways that you can put yourself into danger with a shark and there are ways that you can keep yourself away from it. And I would say that one of the critical things is not swimming at the surface uh, during those times when a crepuscular shark would be most active, so dawn and dusk, and into the hours of early evening. Martin, there are all kinds of sharks in the waters, you know? Hammerheads, white tips, blues, makos. So we are Cape Cod, northern uh, eastern seaboard of North America. All the shark species that he mentions there can be found there, including great whites. And the chances that these bozos got the exact oh, shark... Oh, there's no other sharks like this in these waters. It's a hundred to one. A hundred to one. Now, I'm not saying that this is not the shark. It probably is, Martin. It probably is. It's a man-eater. It's extremely rare for these waters. But the fact is that the bite radius on this animal is different than the wounds on the victim. So the bite radius would tell you about the size of the animal, but each individual indentation would give you a better idea of what shark actually did the biting. And in a lot of cases, because teeth are lost constantly, you might well find one in the bite. <laughs> That's like I thought. I came up in the Gulf Stream from the southern waters. I love this scene so much. He didn't need a car, did he? So, yeah, crazy thing is, tiger sharks have been found with car number plates and um, other pieces of human detritus. I, I even heard that a chunk of a suit of armor was found inside one once. This is mostly true for tiger sharks. Tiger sharks are, have the broadest range of diet of any shark. They'll kind of traverse up and down the water column looking for anything that might be potential food. That could be seabirds on the surface. It could be uh, rotting, decaying whale carcasses. It could be pretty much anything. They, they really don't have a, a very picky appetite. And yes, you could find pretty much anything inside the stomach of a tiger shark. What we are dealing with here is a perfect engine, uh, an eating machine. It's really a miracle of evolution. All this machine does is swim and eat and make little sharks, and that's all. Now, why don't you take a long, close look at this sign? Those proportions are correct. Love to prove that, wouldn't you? Get your name into the National Geographic. Not that line. That's, that's just absolutely fantastic. Um, there are parts of that that are, that are true, there are parts that aren't. Sharks are a miracle of evolution. They've been around for at least 400 million years, potentially quite a lot longer, and they have adapted into not primeval, ancient, ancestral, uh, kind of old throwbacks. Instead, they are perfect at what they do. 
And a big part of that is swimming around and eating and making baby sharks, but it is much more complex than that. We're learning an enormous amount about how sharks migrate, how they socialize, uh, how they, they maintain relationships, how baby lemon sharks will have friends that they forage with. They are much more sophisticated than we ever thought possible. And the more that we keep on hammering that old story that sharks just swim and munch anything that's in front of their faces, the less people are gonna to want to get out there and, and try and help them. And that is the critical thing, because right now we're taking at least a quarter of a billion sharks from the world's oceans every single year. It's a number that cannot be sustained. The great white shark that we're, we're talking about in this wonderful but misguided film doesn't reach sexual maturity until at least 15 years of age, so older than us as human beings, potentially quite a bit longer than that, so very, very uh, slow to regenerate. You take them out, they don't come back. Thanks so much for watching. You can catch Shark with Steve Batchel on Sky Nature now.